You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Kalispera. Kalispera. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 3, page 53. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Robot. I'm just an announcer. Announcer man. Today's story is the second in our Valentine's Story series, and uh, it is The Search for Olympia by Matt Asselford. Matt Asselford is a longtime reader, first time writer who lives with his wife and daughter in the middle of the U.S. We'd like to thank Liz Mirzievsky, Nicole Suddeth, and Abby Hilton for lending their voices to today's episode. Today's music is by Mel's and Project Divinity, and some sound effects were provided by freesound.org. The Search for Olympia by Matt Asselford. The old metal lock clicked and Will stumbled into the room. He dropped his small suitcase on the hard, flat carpet and didn't bother to turn on the lights. Before he could collapse on the nearest bed, he noticed a young woman huddling in the corner where moonlight touched the wall. He did his best to suppress his wavering nerves, but the jingling car keys in his left hand betrayed his attempt to appear calm. I've been looking for you, he said. He wasn't sure if she would hear his words over the staccato thumping sound coming from his chest. I know, she replied, unmoving. I didn't think you'd actually be here. Well, I am, she said, and I'm not going anywhere. I can't believe I finally found you. The girl offered no response. Will's emotions overtook any sense of stability he had left. I love you, he said as tears pooled up in his eyes. On a crisp October night, Amy, a lanky biology major with fierce blue eyes and scarlet red hair, set Will free, and by doing so allowed him to pursue his destiny. They had met the previous year when she applied to be a barista at his coffee shop. He was smitten by her fiery personality and penchant for discussing the works of Edward Abbey. Together, they shared more than a workplace. They lived in a small apartment above the shop that smelled like freshly roasted coffee beans. Will felt they went together like fireworks and apple pie. He appreciated the way Amy's aggressive personality made up for his passiveness. But... As Prometheus learned, when one dabbles with fire, they end up losing something they value greatly. Will learned this lesson after Amy realized she had grown bored of him and didn't love him anymore. She never really had. It had just taken her a while to figure it out. On the aforementioned October night, she told him that she had grown tired of his nerd shit, which he interpreted as comic books, fantasy sports leagues, zombie movies, and everything else that brought him joy. And that their relationship was holding her back from changing the world. Then she left. Will didn't take it well. Like the unfortunate player who selects the wrong Jenga block, he saw his future collapse and scatter in front of him. He wanted to escape whenever he encountered one of her stray red hairs hidden around the house like Easter eggs, or saw her container of hemp lotion in the bathroom the only item she had left behind. The shop offered no sanctuary. Chalk words written by her hand taunted him from above the counter and throughout the store. On the really bad days, he contemplated escaping to the only place where he would never be reminded of her again. After he had mustered up the courage, Will took the diamond-adorned ring he had hidden in the top drawer of their dresser and threw it into the Missouri River. He imagined a small man thousands of years in the future finding the evil thing 
and hauling it off to the fiery depths of a faraway mountain in hope of destroying it once and for all. That's what I need, he said to himself. A purpose in life. I need some sort of quest. And the quest he found, albeit in an unlikely place. Will had never been alone, but dating was out of the question. Not only did he not want to drag someone into his dark cave of depression, but he also spent all of his time at the coffee shop filling in for his departed partner. The physical withdrawal he suffered almost trumped his emotional pain. He developed a significant appetite from his isolation. Instead of reaching for a solid meat-and-potato meal to satisfy his hunger, he grabbed a quick, sugar-filled snack. A snack that tasted good, but left him empty and wanting more. Like all red-blooded American males, Will had owned a couple of playboys when he was in high school. It was more by default than by necessity, though, as he had never had any trouble with girls. After Amy left, he tried to take solace in their pages, but the heavily doctored images printed in catalog-quality ink just wouldn't do it for him anymore. Desperation leads people on unusual paths, and Will was very desperate. The first time he logged on to an adult website, he drew the shades and looked over his shoulder as if someone was going to scold him. Eventually, he overcame his apprehension and joined the millions across the world using technology in ways its designers never intended. It helped ease his pain, but he never became comfortable with what he was doing. It could never replace the human contact he so greatly missed. That is until he saw Olympia. Will was browsing a website advertising Naughty Girls Next Door when he first saw her. Her skin was as creamy and unblemished as a warm glass of milk. A few of the freckles that had been sprinkled on her nose had fallen off and landed on the top of her bare chest. Her raven-colored hair framed her heart-shaped face and tickled the top of her nubile body. Will thought she could have been the girl who tempted Samson, or the one who caused the Trojan War. She reminded him of the women painted on the sides of World War II fighter planes, and the ones painted by famous artists, specifically Edouard Manet. Olympia's ageless beauty may have drawn Will in, but it was her radiant green eyes that ensnared him. Most of the digital girls Will had encountered displayed either a distant, drugged look in their eyes, or, worse yet, a slightly scared one. Not Olympia. Her eyes projected a confidence and a liveliness he had never seen before, and never would again. Her sexy, positive demeanor was infectious. Upon gazing at her, Will had no choice but to feel better than he had in a long time. She was perfect. She was his destiny, and he had finally found her. Olympia became his goddess. He sacrificed every available minute, hour, and day he had to her. He sifted through countless sites like an old prospector in order to find a new image of her. Whenever he was lucky enough to find a speck of gold, he added the site to his little bag of gems, an inclusive cache of bookmarks, like emeralds, diamonds, and pearls. Each link was extremely valuable to him. All of Olympia's appearances looked similar, but each was subtly different, like fraternal twins. The photos consisted of her, alone, twisting her body into some unnatural pose while shedding off some ridiculous outfit. As silly as the images were, Will relished each one. It was the emotion in her eyes that made each picture memorable. After spending a few weeks with Olympia, Will's outlook improved. He was convinced that he wasn't ready to leave the world anymore, not while she was still in it. Will witnessed many horrors as he searched for Olympia, the terrible, unnatural things people did to themselves for the enjoyment of complete strangers. He wondered if these were the sort of things the Greeks had in mind long ago as they worshipped Eros. If Cupid was prouder of us when he looked down at us from Mount Olympus, or up from Hades. As he passed by these images, it sickened him, but he trudged on in search of her. 
After a month of visual therapy, Will was able to re-establish his old life. To thank him for babysitting his four-year-old niece, Emma, Will's sister, set him up on a blind date with one of her friends. Over dinner, he learned that Megan was an athletic youth counselor with a bubbly personality. He enjoyed himself and thought she was cute. But their relationship didn't make it to a second date. She was a good catch, but not good enough. She couldn't compare to Olympia. Following a rather rough day at the shop, Will hoped to find some new photos of Olympia. He found a new spread, but it was different from the others. This time, she had a co-star. A fat, balding man with patches of brown hair on his pasty white back. The man looked like a grizzly bear that had caught a small, helpless fawn in its massive paws. The images infuriated and sickened Will, but he glanced at them long enough to notice that something about Olympia had changed. The liveliness in her eyes was gone, replaced by a numb, vacant look. He swore that the girl in the pictures was actually a waxwork replica of Olympia. The horrific images haunted Will, but not as much as the realization that Olympia, his goddess, was in trouble. He had to save her, as she had saved him. He knew he would face trials, knew he would be tested, but nothing was going to stop him from rescuing the damsel in distress. Like Sir Galahad, Will set out on an epic quest to find his holy grail, a mysterious girl named Olympia. Will was ready to begin his journey, but he had no idea where to start. He knew Olympia intimately, but he knew nothing about her. He attempted to use various search engines to locate her, but he didn't even know her real name. Like a noir gumshoe, he combed over every piece of evidence at his disposal until he discovered a clue. Every website that featured Olympia was copyrighted by Multimedia Models Incorporated. In order to utilize this information, Will required assistance from a wizened old leader. Multimedia Models Incorporated, like all adult websites, had to register with the federal government to ensure their models were over the age of 18. Will submitted a Freedom of Information Act request to the Department of Justice and paced around like a boxer before a fight. Not exactly busting heads or breaking fingers to gain information, but it worked. Uncle Sam gave him a vital tool, an address for the offices of Multimedia Models Incorporated. With this tool, he hopped into the Honda Civic, his mighty white steed, and sped off toward a faraway land. Will was on I-80 between Omaha and Lincoln when his phone rang. A familiar voice was on the other side of the line, a voice he had not heard in quite some time. Amy told Will she had given up with trying to change the world. She said she wanted to go back to the way things were, to pretend that nothing had happened. She said she was willing to settle for him. Will considered a proposal and decided that if she would have called him earlier when he was weaker, he would have bowed into the temptation. Not now, though. He was on a quest. After he explained his decision to Amy... A bundle of curses and profanities shot out of her mouth like fireballs. Will tried to make the trek in one day, but his drooping eyes made him stop in Santa Fe for the night. He reached his destination around noon of the following day. The offices of Multimedia Models Incorporated were nestled in the grainy, industrial part of Phoenix. As he entered the lobby, Will took a deep breath and wondered if he needed a gun. Will felt like he entered the offices of a small-time real estate agency. Plain, off-white plaster walls covered the lobby. A tall plastic plant, the only splash of color in the room, stood in a corner as if it was being punished. A few women sat along the walls and conversed while filling out paperwork. A mundane, middle-aged woman sat behind the faux wood desk that had been placed in the center pulling energy toward it like a black hole. The woman reminded him of his middle school English teacher, Mrs. Pitts. May I help you? She asked. 
picture of a pug wearing a cowboy outfit sat on her desk, next to a worn-out paperback with a shirtless pirate on the cover. She wore a wide, tight grin on her face, as if she had experienced a previous run-in with Nicholson's Joker. Yes. He said, trying to hide his excitement. I'm looking for one of your models. She looks like this. He said, pulling a folded picture of Olympia out of his back pocket. All of the girls stopped talking and focused their attention on the center of the room. The crumpled picture quivered in front of the woman's face. I'm sorry, sir. I can't give out any information. It's our policy. Her voice tasted bittersweet, like when the doctor tries to mask oral medicine with an artificial flavor. Trust me, I'm not crazy or anything. I need to find her. I think she's in trouble. I appreciate that, sir. She replied, still smiling. But it's our policy to respect the privacy of our models. And, and I understand that, but I really need to find her. Will said with frustration seeping into his voice. The woman's facial expression remained the same. Will was convinced she was a robot, some sort of evil android. Look, I've come so far. Sir. She interjected. And I'm so close. Sir. That I'll do anything, anything. Sir. She shouted. The smile was gone, replaced by a snarl. A couple of the onlookers gasped. <gasps> After a brief pause and a glance around the room, she regained her composure and said, Listen, I'm not going to give you any information. This conversation is over. Turn around and go back to wherever you came from before I call security. But... Go! Dejected and humiliated, Will exited the building and stepped out into the hot, dry air. The giggles he had heard on his way out of the office echoed in his head. He sat on the hot concrete and put his face in his hands. He had reached the gate, but was unable to get the key from the guardian. He had failed. In this moment of defeat, Will felt a warm hand rest upon his shoulder. You okay, hon? Will nodded, trying to look tough. Don't let Pam get to you. She's a total cunt to everyone. Will looked up into the face of one of the women from the lobby. She was tall and sinewy, with skin like leather. Two large, symmetrical breasts hung off her small torso. This woman, like many, had tried to substitute modern medicine for the fountain of youth, but the result made her look older than she really was. I failed her, he said, trying not to cry. Failed who? Her, he said, holding up the picture of Olympia. Charlotte? You failed Charlotte? Jesus, you must have done something really awful to fail her. A warm grin emerged on the woman's face as she put her hands on her hips. At that moment, she reminded Will of his mother, his grandmother, and every mother he had ever met. You knew her? Hon, when you've been doing this as long as I have, you know all the girls that come through here. I didn't know Charlotte real well, but I was around her enough to know she was a real sweetheart. Like finding a lost key, Will recognized the woman. He had seen her. All of her. Back at his apartment when he was searching for images of Olympia. Her name was Gia, and she had a fading tattoo of the earth on her right wrist. Do you know where I can find her? How I can reach her? Will asked, blushing a little. I'm sorry, hon. I don't know. All I know is that she headed back to Iowa, or maybe it was Michigan, I don't know, some place like that. She probably left a month ago. Thanks, Will said. I definitely owe you one. He was grateful for the assistance, but wished Gia's foggy information had been a little clearer. No problem, hon. Good luck, she said, walking back to the office. Olympia wasn't the girl's name, it was Charlotte. Repeating the name out loud, Charlotte, Will remembered something vital. Wait, wait, Will shouted at Gia. What was her name? What? She said, pausing at the door. Charlotte, what was her name? It was Ben Franza. Charlotte Ben Franza, but don't ask me to spell it. Ben Franza? What is that, French? No, I think it was Irish. She kept telling us she was an Irish princess. So when you find her, you treat her like one, okay? A massive wall still separated Will from Charlotte, but Gia had given him the proper tools to break it down. He just had to figure out how they fit together. 
Back at his hotel room, Will tweaked the information until he broke the code. He found Charlotte, not Olympia, on a social networking site. According to the site, her name was Charlotte Benfrianza. She was 21 years old and hailed from Winterset, Iowa. When Will realized that she had probably driven through Omaha on her way back to Iowa, he felt foolish. If he just would have stayed home, he may have been able to meet her without driving across the country. Although it seemed like an odd name, Will found multiple Banfrianzas in Winterset and around the surrounding area, none of which were named Charlotte. He considered calling each one, but wasn't sure what he'd say if he actually got her on the line. He thought it would be easier to explain his actions in person, so he printed off all the addresses and prepared himself to go door to door until he found her, making sure she was safe. Before he drifted off to sleep, Will discovered one last piece of information. A short article from the Grand Island Independent. The small town paper hadn't made the shift to electronic articles yet. The story had been manually clipped, scanned, and uploaded onto the website. The archaic craftsmanship resulted in small, illegible text. Will could only make out Charlotte's name and something about a room in a locally owned motel. Will left the next morning, squinting as he drove into the rising sun. He sped the whole way, but the car felt like it was crawling. Something pulled Will off the interstate when he reached Grand Island. He could have made it to Omaha, but he was drawn to the footprint Charlotte had left behind. When Will requested the room mentioned in the article, the old man behind the desk gave him a queer look and told him they had plenty of other rooms available. The wood panel covered walls and the handwritten date book showed that the innkeeper was telling the truth. After Will reiterated his request, the old man shrugged his shoulders and handed him a cold metal key. Walking down the hallway, Will believed that he was prepared for anything that might be waiting for him in the empty room. I know you do, babe, Charlotte said as she began to rise. In the full moonlight, Charlotte appeared paler than Will remembered. She looked monochromatic like a character out of the old black-and-white movies Will's parents had watched when he was a kid. Even her scant outfit, cotton underwear and a ridged tank top, was tinted gray. She still looked stunning, though, except for the one other aspect of her appearance that had changed. A pair of long, open slits ran from the middle of each of her forearms to the bases of each of her palms. They troubled Will but the lack of blood flowing from the wounds troubled him even more. Charlotte's graceful movement prevented Will from concentrating on her wrists. Seeing her in motion made him imagine a massive flipbook composed of her digital images. As she approached him, he felt as comfortable as a seventh grader in the proximity of a first crush. He wanted to hug her, to hold her, but he couldn't move. When she reached him, she took a seat, on the adjacent bed, crossed her arms, bowed her head toward the floor, and told him a tale about a fair maiden. Charlotte was born and raised in Winterset, Iowa, to two loving parents, Jack and Diane. She experienced a typical Midwestern childhood, trips to the family farm, skin knees, and county fairs. The path of her life had been rather straightforward until she reached her high school graduation and encountered two diverging paths. One road led to Iowa State, her father's alma mater, and an engineering degree. The other, although much more rugged, led to her lifelong dream. Charlotte was blessed with many assets, but beauty was the one she utilized most. Like an effective con artist, she used her good looks to her advantage, and had always been able to stay ahead of those in pursuit of her. She knew this attribute had an expiration date and wanted to see how far it could take her while it was still ripe. Her friend Julie tempted her to move to Phoenix and join her in pursuing a modeling career. Charlotte's parents disagreed with the decision, but they couldn't stop her from migrating to the southwest to pursue her dream. Charlotte had trouble adapting to Phoenix. She missed the summer cornfields and the winter snowdrifts. 
She also struggled to adapt to the industry. Each scout told her she was pretty, but added that she was either too heavy or too short for the job. If they would have gotten to know her better, they would have learned that Charlotte was either too optimistic or too stubborn to listen to them. Eventually, Charlotte's resiliency paid off. One of her images appeared in retail stores across America. Unfortunately, the image consisted of her adorning a cheap witch's costume and could only be found in cheap Halloween boutiques. She was encouraged by the progress, but the progress stopped there. Long after her parents had quit sending her money, the stack of rejections dwindled her savings away. She was struggling, but her friend Julie had a solution. Julie had been forced to lower her expectations in order to pay the bills. She was thriving as a nude model. Her boyfriend Mike was a professional photographer and took all of her pictures. Julie invited Charlotte to tag along on a shoot. If she was interested, Mike was willing to shoot a few pictures and pass them along to some distributors. The proposition intrigued Charlotte. Charlotte was timid the first time she posed, but the closed, friendly atmosphere helped ease her nerves. She started off simple, a few topless shots, but got more adventurous as her confidence grew. She enjoyed the shoots and felt empowered by the thought of bewitching hundreds of men simultaneously. Charlotte was quite successful, but she quit posing nude after Julie and Mike had moved to Los Angeles. She had no desire to work with anyone else, and wanted to resume the pursuit of her dream. The unplanned detour had increased her confidence and ability, but it had ultimately harmed her. No traditional modeling agency was willing to work with a porn model. Unable to find work, Charlotte was left jobless, broke, and alone. But she still wasn't ready to give up. She reached out to her one last beacon of hope. Multimedia Models Incorporated. The company had purchased all of her original photos and had always wanted more. Charlotte showed up for her first appointment and found herself surrounded by complete strangers. They asked her to do things with a co-star, a slug of a man who smelled like dirty socks. She was scared, but she agreed to it. This was her last chance. During the session, Charlotte felt numb and distant like she was watching her actions on some perverted reality show. After her final shoot, Charlotte realized she had made a mistake. She had chosen the wrong path when she came to Phoenix. She was left with no option but to give up and return home. She hoped she could pick up where she left off. She hoped Iowa State would take her. She hoped her parents would take her. She hoped the right guy, when she met him, would take her. She hoped she could go back and start over. Charlotte's mistake had taken away her greatest power. She didn't feel pretty anymore. She felt ashamed for betraying her dream, her parents, and her body. This feeling overwhelmed her as she got closer to home. When she could no longer see the road through her tears, she pulled over and paid for a room at the first motel she encountered. That night, Charlotte tossed and turned in the starchy sheets, unable to sleep. Her experience in Phoenix had left no marks, but the memories from her final shoot had stained her. She thought a warm bath would wash the spot away, but it was too deep. The water hadn't worked, so she tried to bleed it out. She cut deeper and deeper, but passed out before she could reach the source of the stain. When Charlotte woke up, she rose to her feet, but her body didn't follow. It remained in the bathtub, seeped in water the color of cranberry juice. She tried to stop the bleeding, but it was too late. She kneeled next to her body for hours, screaming at it to wake up. It never did. A cleaning lady found her the next morning, followed by the local policeman. A pair of EMTs came and hauled her body away, and Charlotte was left alone. After Charlotte finished her story, Will reached out and embraced her, tucking her head against his chest. 
He felt a chill being emitted by her bare skin, like gloveless hands on a cool autumn day. Wait a minute. You died? Are you dead? Will asked after the seeds of her words took root within him. Her head nodded against his chest. Will's mouth hung open, and his eyes stared off into the distance as he collected his thoughts. So what does that mean? You're a ghost or something? She leaned back and looked into his eyes. I guess so. I don't feel like a ghost, though. I just feel like me. Will noticed that she was solid, not wispy or transparent like ghosts in movies. His first impression had been correct. The warm colors had been drained from her. In fact, even her powerful green eyes were ashen. I'm so sorry, Will said. I tried so hard to find you, to save you, but I was too late. I know what you did, babe. You couldn't have done anything different. It's, it's all my fault. I'm the one who's sorry. I'm the one who broke the rules. Shakespeare was right. The world's a stage and we're all actors. We each have individual scripts to follow. When we take an early exit, we can't re-enter the scene and we can't leave the theater. We have to sit around and wait for the end of the show. What do you mean? I mean that I'm still here because I killed myself. It wasn't my time to go. Now I have to sit here and wait until it is. You mean you have to sit here until you were supposed to die? Like if you hadn't killed yourself? That could be like 60 years. I know. It's been three weeks already, and trust me, it's a real treat. I've tried to leave the room, but can't. I've even tried to jump out the window. It's like I'm tethered to the wall. It sucks. Will did his best to lighten the mood, just as he always did whenever he was faced with conflict. It could be worse, you know. You could have jumped off a bridge and be stuck at the bottom of a river watching the fish swim by. You at least get to watch TV. I suppose that's one way to look at it, she said, cracking a smile. The parts of Will that touched Charlotte's bare skin were getting numb. Can I get you a blanket? You're freezing. Just one of the perks. I can't feel anything hot, cold, hunger, pain, but it's actually kind of nice. Because it's not like there's a buffet in here. I guess it'll help you keep that great figure, Will said, causing Charlotte's smile to grow. Do you at least get any special powers or anything? Charlotte took the bait. She enjoyed visiting with someone about her newly acquired condition. Well, I'm not exactly Egon Spangler, but I've learned one thing. Whatever I'm made out of dissipates in electric light. Probably because it's unnatural. I don't actually go anywhere, but it's not like I'm the invisible woman. I can't interact with anything. Sunlight does the same thing. As far as I can tell, I'm only detectable in moonlight. So far, Charlotte added, I've been able to fly under the radar, but a few nights ago, a middle-aged couple decided to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary here. Real romantic, I know. I turned away when they started getting frisky. Kind of out of respect, but mainly because it was gross. Anyway, I turned around and saw myself in the mirror. I had to dive under the bed to avoid being seen. Not cool at all. Between the stress of senior sex and the sight of the ghost girl in the room, I bet you would have pushed one of their hearts over the limit. Will said. But I guess it's one way to get a sidekick. Charlotte's uncontrolled <laughs> laughter gave Will the proper atmosphere to ask her the question he'd been pondering all night. How do you know me if we've never met? Or are you like this with every handsome guy that swings through central Nebraska? Charlotte straightened her face and said, It's weird. After I died, I had a memory of you. I knew what you were up to that you were looking for me. You were trying to save me, my little Prince Charming. She rubbed her hand back and forth on the top of his head, messing up his hair. He pulled her back onto the bed, and she slid her knee up his thigh and over his belly button, draping her cold leg across his midsection. Will felt the urge to kiss her, but before he could, she started talking again. We're... She trailed off and paused, like she had just uttered a little snippet of an untold secret. We're what? Uh, never mind. I, I forgot what I was going to say. Will didn't believe Charlotte, but he didn't want to press her. A fight was the last thing he wanted to experience on their first night together. Is there a way to bring you back? Back to life, I mean. Seems like there's a ton of ways to do it in comic books and movies. 
Only if you've got a flux capacitor and something that can make it up to 88 miles an hour, she said with a coy smile. 1.21 gigawatts! Will shouted in his best Christopher Lloyd impersonation, causing Charlotte to burst out with laughter. (laughs) God, you just turned my laugh up to 11, Charlotte said, snorting. After they settled down, Will asked, What is that, like two 80s references since I met you? Technically, three. Uh, The Ghostbusters one went right over your head. I absolutely love 80s movies. They're my favorite thing in the whole world. But you're just a kid. What were you, like negative three when Ghostbusters came out? Listen, it's not my fault I was born in the wrong decade, mister. Their conversation got sidetracked into the realm of John Hughes' screenplays, Ren McCormick's feet, and Patrick Swayze's mullet. Will was in the middle of arguing why Commando was Schwarzenegger's best film. He cuts a dude's arm off with a machete in one swipe! In one swipe! When Charlotte cut him off, although she was enjoying the banter, she knew they had more pressing matters to discuss. Before, when you asked how I knew you, I didn't tell you everything, she said, avoiding eye contact with him. After I died, I also had a memory of my future, not this, she said waving her arm across the room like a game show host. But what was supposed to be? It didn't go too far ahead, but it went far enough. This is hard for me to say, but I was supposed to stay in bed that night. I was supposed to fall asleep. The next morning, after checking out and driving towards Iowa, I was supposed to find you at your coffee shop in Omaha. Before, I was trying to tell you that you and I are soulmates, Will. We were supposed to be together forever, but I blew it. When Will was 11, he had a dream that he was given every action figure he had ever wanted. He kept them in a plastic case and hid the case under his bed so no one would take them away. When he woke up from the dream, he searched under his bed, but the case was gone. Charlotte's revelation caused him to suffer this feeling once again. What does that mean for me now? Will asked, with devastation seeping into his voice. If we were destined to meet, to be together, and we didn't, what exactly does that mean for me? Charlotte looked like she wanted to cry, to empathize with Will, but no tears flowed from her eyes. My life is completely worthless. It's it's like I'm living a consolation prize. That's not true, Charlotte said, trying to comfort Will who hung his head like a prize fighter that had just lost a title bout. She rubbed his arched back, but quit when he started speaking again. It's not over, though. There's still a way we can be together, Will said, sounding more determined than he ever had before. You're gone. We can't change that. I have nothing to live for anymore. Nothing at all. So I'm going to join you. Tonight... I'm going to kill myself in this room. No, you aren't, Charlotte said, her voice creaking with desperation. That's a terrible idea. It's not going to happen. I won't let it. What's the problem? Will said, hurt by her response. He had committed to his decision and had been sure that she would feel flattered by his willingness to be her martyr, her Romeo. This is no way to exist. You think this is what I want, to be stuck in this room until God knows when, to lose everything? She lowered her voice and said, I miss my family. I miss my home. I miss everything. I'm miserable. Absolutely miserable. There is no way I'm going to let you make the same mistake. I don't care, Will said. It can't be that bad. Being next to you would be worth it. I love you. His emotions had been building throughout the conversation, but his declaration put him over the edge. I know you do, but think about it for a second. This isn't a few weeks we're talking about here. It's a lifetime. What if I'm gone tomorrow? What if it's ten years from now? You'd be stuck here all alone, having sacrificed yourself for nothing. I would have done it for you. Listen, I appreciate it, I really do, but it's the wrong decision. Suicide solves no problems. Trust me, it is the ultimate act of selfishness, and it's always a mistake. Look, you have a full life ahead of you. Treasure it. There is nothing more valuable in the world. Don't hang your head, Charlotte added. 
we still have tonight. I'm not going anywhere, but tomorrow you need to leave this place and never come back. No matter how badly you want to, promise me you'll never come back. If you do, it'll only be harder for the both of us. You'll only be tempted to join me, and we may not be as strong next time. I don't exist for you anymore. Your life's wide open now. You get to create your own ending. It's a powerful thing, so don't waste it. As you wish, Will replied with a sly grin while trying to stifle his tears. He didn't agree with Charlotte, but he loved her too much to defy her. Relieved, Charlotte playfully punched Will in the stomach. Then she leaned forward and kissed him. Her mouth was as cold and dry as the winter's wind, but Will didn't care. He placed his hand on her cheeks and let his palms drift down over her neck and across her shoulders. After they paused on the small of her back, Will tried to move things to the next level by sliding his thumbs under the elastic band of her underwear. It took him a second, but he realized this was impossible. Her clothes were a part of her. Sorry, Tiger, Charlotte said between kisses. But they don't come off, literally. Just another perk. Will was disappointed, but was content with the kisses. Actually, he was content just by being next to her. Like a wave emerging from the ocean and flowing towards a beautiful sandcastle, a ray of sunlight dotted the floor and slowly crept toward the bed. The sun had interrupted Charlotte and Will's physical display of affection. They watched it rise like a couple of love-struck vampires, knowing that its ascension meant their doom. Charlotte was the first to break the silence. Look, we don't have much time. Promise me something, Will. Promise you won't forget about me? I promise, Charlotte. Now, listen, I'm not sure where I'm headed after this, but I'll be waiting for you. You found me once. Promise you'll come find me again? I will. I promise I'll go wherever I need to. I promise I'll never quit until I find you. I love you, Will said, rushing to get the words out of his mouth. I love you, too. Charlotte replied, fading away, just as she said she would. As she faded, Charlotte pointed her index finger up toward the sky and mouthed the words, Be good. They both smiled, and then Charlotte was gone. Will was outside of Grand Island when the blizzard hit. He was driving to Denver to celebrate his grandson's 17th birthday. It was the first time he was making the trip without his wife, Elise. Will had loved Elise, but he had never forgotten Charlotte. The windshield wipers were no match for the thick, fat snowflakes peppering the windshield. So Will had to pull over. His eyes weren't what they once were, but he could make out a small motel in the distance. The innkeeper gave him a key to the last available room, and Will found himself walking down a familiar hallway and breaking an old vow. Charlotte? Will asked as he peeked through the doorway. He had forgotten what she looked like because he had deleted the images of her long ago. Like light from distant stars, digital pictures are visible long after their source has faded away. But Will hadn't been tempted to seek them out and view them. After meeting Charlotte, he didn't need them anymore. Besides, he had realized that Olympia had looked nothing like Charlotte. Charlotte, I'm sorry. I know I promised, but I had no choice. I had to stop, Will said, entering the room. There was a brief break in the clouds, and a beam of moonlight illuminated the entire room. During this moment, Will was certain he would finally see Charlotte again. But she was no longer there. She had moved on to whatever had come next. Thinking of her, Will leaned back on the bed, closed his eyes, smiled, and hoped the end of his quest was near.
Author's note. I can't imagine a lot of people start writing when they turn 29. I've always been an avid reader, but I was never tempted to write. That is, until I read Stephen King's semi-autobiography on writing while I was on a business trip. He made it sound simple. Not easy, but simple. And I began jotting down ideas. Some made it into this story. And some made it into others. I've always been attracted to stories that have a dark edge to them but aren't necessarily vicious or terrifying like the works of Neil Gaiman and Guillermo del Toro. As a result, this tale originated as a ghost story. The idea that ghosts are the remnants of people who die for one reason or another before their predestined time. I decided to use the elements of a timeless hero epic to tell the story. In this case, Will searching for Olympia rather than Arthur searching for Excalibur. Or countless other versions of this basic tale. In order to add a contemporary spin to the story, I envisioned Olympia as a nude internet model, and Will as the man who honestly fell in love with her. Which was challenging because I didn't want Will to come off as creepy or insincere. In the end, I felt all of these different themes and ideas gelled nicely, and I greatly enjoyed writing this story. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Okay, welcome back. Yeah, thank you for sending us that story, Matt. Now, you said you were a first-time writer. Does that mean that this was his first published story? Or is this his first ever story? I don't know. If it's his first ever story, then this guy's destined for some pretty intense stardom someday. As long as he writes a second story, that is. Because that was pretty good, I thought. I think it's more likely that it's just his first published story. I don't know, though. Can, can you remember your first ever story? Like ever, ever? Like the no, one that I wrote today. as kindergarten? Yeah, well, I mean, kind if, of a thing. if you wrote a story in kindergarten, sure. Somewhere, like, my parents kept some old crap that I'd done at school and stuff like that. Like Usually we, put it in the diaper genie, but... Yeah, they, you know, we pasted together some kind of American flag when I was in kindergarten. Well, it also turns out that I wrote a story called... I think it was called The Biggest Pumpkin, I want to say. <laughs> but yeah, I read that, and it, it's one of, you know... Well, you probably don't know because you don't have kids. But I have kids, and I've read similar stories now since they've all gone to school. They don't make sense. Mine didn't make sense at all. Just about a pumpkin, and then there was a weird ending about somebody throwing seeds out into the pumpkin patch after Halloween. I guess that was when the pumpkin was slaughtered. You can still hear the screaming <laughs> of the pumpkin, Clarice. That may have been my first story ever. Huh. Now, when I was in seventh grade, Mrs. White, who was a teacher I never really got along with, but she made us all write a poem. And I wrote a poem about a rat. It was just one of those things that you do for half hour in school. Right. The, but the only reason I remember this poem is because she kept it. And when my brother went to school or my sisters went to <laughs> school and they had Mrs. White, she still had this poem on the wall. It's possible because she still it. had it. And it had a drawing of a rat that I had done. And I just thought that that was so strange because, A, Mrs. White never liked me. She seemed <laughs> to never like me. But, two, the poem was awful. And it, you know, it was trite and it rhymed head with bed and book with cook and leopard with peppered. It did. So, so you read it too. It's weird. It's just everywhere. Yeah, I, that's I, what I'm most known I've for. I'm that, like Stephen King and the damn stand. I've got that book of your collected poetry, actually. You gave it to me and signed it. You remember that? I'm so pathetic. It was all your uh, poems that you wrote for girls when you were desperate for them and then later couldn't look at them again. You know me too well. <laughs> well, I do believe we once spoke on that subject on this very show. Yeah. That's right, folks. Uh, you know, that that does remind me. There was a girl that I wrote a poem to, and I didn't sign it. And I sent, I gave it to her. I, I, it was, uh, I, I put it in you her. You put it into her locker? Yeah. And a couple months later, she mentioned the poem, and she knew that I had written it. Ooh. And I said, well, I don't, what, did I put my name on that? How did I know? And she's like, it just seemed like something you would do. <laughs> you know, in retrospect, I don't know if that's flattering or if that's embarrassing. I think at the time I was just like, oh. Last night I put a note on Laura's desk. 
She knows I wrote. How does that song go? That's Announcer so... man, you know what to say. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Warning: Today's episode contains singing. What? What is that's, that? That's that Jonathan Colton song that's going to be the, the, the future soon. Knows. Yeah. <laughs> she knows I wrote it. Now the whole class does. Now I'm all alone during couple skates. <laughs> she goes by with some guy on her arm. It's going to be the future soon, Rish. You won't always be this way when the things that make you weak and strange get engineered away. You know, I really should just be able to do my whole life over, folks. Because <laughs> I have screwed up so much. And, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. It's one of those things where you don't know when you're young the things that you know when you're older. And if somebody took you aside and told you, you wouldn't listen to them. Because it would be like, what the hell do you know? <laughs> or, or because you can't process the thought that none of this matters right now. Yeah. And that why not go out there and make an ass of yourself? Why not go? Um, is this a cursing episode? <laughs> why not go and... You are here, so yes. <laughs> you know, I, I, I really like the English language. I, all of the English language. So, you know, I'm not going to box myself in and say, you know, part of it is going to be cut off and forgotten. Yeah, but I'm going to bleep over all your curses. <laughs> bleep you but it's just yeah it's one of those things what would have been so terrible if i had a small fortune what the hell was that if i had just signed my name and said you know hey i like you yeah it's, it's like why why did that have to be a state secret why did i have to get j edgar <laughs> hoover to cover my tracks make sure my phone line couldn't be traced I, which, of course, has absolutely nothing to do with Matt Asselford's story. But it's just like, this is my experience with love, folks. <laughs> I mean, it's all one-sided. It's all tragic. You know, I, I didn't even get it on with a ghost. <laughs> well, neither did he, because clothes couldn't come off. Oh, they were part of her. I can't catch a break, this guy. No, yeah, it's pretty sad. It was an interesting story, though, don't you think? Here's a question for you. Okay. I forget you're going to drive this episode. I'm putting the keys in now. So, um... Seatbelt. This guy... I just won't let you drive. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm that guy who's like, no, it is my car, my name on the registration. You're the guy that has the chicken break on the passenger side, so even if you're... Is that what they call that? The chicken break? That's what I always thought it was called. I don't know. Yeah. So even if somebody else is driving, you can still put on the brakes. <laughs> okay. Third time's a charm. I will not interrupt you. So this guy, Will, he... Breaks up with his girlfriend, and he gets into... No, no, no. She breaks up with him. Okay. Shoot, you are driving. Sorry. Same thing. I there was... is a breakup with him and his girlfriend, and he gets heavily into porn uh -huh. and falls in love with the porn star that he's checking out somehow. And then he goes after this porn star chick to find her. Now, is this guy a good guy? <laughs> is he... A crazy guy. Is he a creepy stalker? Or is he someone we should like? I, I think because of the way the story's written, we like this guy all the same. You know, he's he's our main character. He's likable. But some of the things that he does are the kind of creepy things that people go to jail for. It was, it was kind of an interesting thing to think about this guy who falls in love with a porn star and goes out to save her. And the way the story's written, it, it's his destiny was to meet this girl. And so one way or another, it was going to happen. Kind of What do you think of that? What? Well, I didn't write this story, but I might have. Uh huh. It was so easy to relate to Will. And yeah, I guess I have been accused of stalking the same girl who knew that I had sent the poem. She inferred that I was a stalker back in the days before there was the word. And I was like, well, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. She's like, you drive by every single day. And I was like, well, pff, it's on the way home from work. And she's like, yeah, okay, well, do you work eight times a day? And, and she's uh, like, well, you snuck in my back window and stole a pair of my underpants. And what, what did you say then? I, I said, so, someone did that. I just happened <laughs> to wrest them from that person's hands uh, and bring them back. To, well, I haven't brought them back to you yet, but I, I may. <laughs> I don't know. For me, it was easy to relate to Will. I never felt like he was a bad guy. Uh, I mean, this story vindicates the guy because of the whole destiny stuff. I never thought that way either. I don't know. I just related with him. The way the story was written made him relatable. And then after we'd 
recorded the story, I went out to get some of the girls to play some of the voices. And I, and I sent a note out to Nicole saying, okay, we want you to do this character. You're the receptionist at the modeling agency. And she's really grumpy. And and she's like, yeah, what kind of grumpy am I? I'm like, well, you know, you're, you're dealing with a weirdo who has just showed up trying to meet one of the porn models from your modeling agency. So... I guess you really should be very grumpy with this person because, yeah, people that drive across country and show up at a modeling agency to meet a naked model they have fallen in love with, are they're not stable people. And that was the first time I ever thought, you know, this guy does a lot of weird crap. This guy's a bit of a creep, isn't he? Maybe it's because of the fantasy element that's put in there where you have the ghost, you have the destiny, you have the... Right, but none of that comes into it until after that. That's true. But it still seems a little bit that way. Well, from a feminine perspective, I guess yeah, they I would watch that. this in a very different case because maybe they imagine themselves to be Olympia or they manage themselves uh-huh. to be a bystander in this situation, somebody working at that agency. Yeah, a lot of guys that do these things that become fixated on actresses or fixated on models or whatever that are unstable. Eh? Yeah, I wondered what our our listeners might be thinking if we have female listeners that are listening to that story going, holy crap, or if they're going along with it the same way that you and I did. Well, I think part of it is just life experience has taught me that I am that guy. You're and, the creep. So. Well, no, that's that's kind of the thing. You know, I'm I'm a creep. I'm a weirdo. What the hell am I doing here? You don't belong here. That's me. I mean, I'm me. I don't think I'm a creep, even if every other person that I've ever been around does. Even and I do, really. We, as guys, don't really understand the threat that males pose. True. Um, you know, the, the My Sister Sam girl or the Poltergeist girl or just one of these people that have been murdered by fans. You know, that just doesn't happen. David Letterman, notwithstanding, people don't stalk male guys and try and kill them. <laughs> Although, Mark David Chapman, okay, never mind. Uh, uh, Maybe if you're a celebrity, a male celebrity, you can understand. But any other guy, it might be more difficult. Yeah. Uh, But every woman, whether they're celebrity or not, probably understands that, that, you know, you see a guy at night in the dark sitting under a tree or in an alley or in a parked car, and maybe you get that sense of, is that guy looking at me? Is that guy going to follow me home? And that's something that we fear as kids, but we grow out of it most of the time. I mean, granted, as the last couple of weeks have shown, (laughs) I'm afraid of everything, but that's a real valid fear for a woman. And it's something that I probably don't take into enough consideration, especially when I brand myself not a stalker or not a creep or not a serial rapist. The last part was a joke. (laughs) Apparently not funny. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. Announcer man got it. (sighs) Thanks, announcer man. You know, that's interesting. I wouldn't have brought this subject up had I been driving. So that's something to think about. To put myself in the other shoes, the, the, the high-heeled shoes, the sensible orthopedic the shoes. The no-nonsense pumps. That's a I, word that I've always hated, pumps. Yeah? <laughs> I don't know why. You know what I dislike even more is a word that men just don't use is when they call a shirt a top. Ooh. That's a really cute top you got. Only girls say that. Huh. No guy ever has called something a top unless it's one of those things that spins on the ground. Um, or half of a homosexual pair. Oh, you had to go there. I was just thinking, you know, something on the top. Back on topic, guys. You know, we're both writers. That's something that we got to take into consideration all the time is the what is the opposite perspective? What is something that I hadn't looked at? It? Well, what is the point of view of this other person? So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not saying that people should comment whether they thought Will was a stalker or a psycho <laughs> or a creep because it's up to you to determine. Uh, this, this last year in 2009, that movie All About Steve came out. And it was Sandra Bullock becomes fixated on Bradley Cooper and he's a TV news anchor and he goes off to cover some story and she goes after him because she's sure that there's been some kind of connection between them and she goes off to prove her love to this guy. And it was pitched as a, you know, a lighthearted comedy, but all the reviews and everybody that saw it was just like, wow, this is fatal attraction light. And if, if Sandra Bullock had been played by a man, this would be a horror movie. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? It was this is a double standard kind of thing. 
that should not be tolerated, which I thought was weird because, you know, it's Sandra Bullock, America's sweetheart. Yeah, everybody loves Sandra. Um, and yet people are like saying, hey, you know what? This isn't right. I just saw the uh, one of the most recent episodes of Castle the uh, other day. And in this one, this woman ends up dead. And they find out that she has drugged somebody. She has drugged a man. And Castle makes the comment, who would give a roofie to a guy? If you want to have sex with a guy, all you got to do is ask. <laughs> and then, of course, that comment is made again later in the episode. And yeah... I guess maybe that's where the double standard comes from, you know? It, it's not the same kind of a thing. So anyways, I don't know. I mean, I thought this was a really cool story. I've got my own personal guy who's in love with a ghost kind of a story in my own head that will probably never be written because that's the way I am. It's kind of an interesting idea, the lost opportunity, I guess, that these two have had. And here's another thing about this story. This, this poor woman that's mentioned at the end, Il Elise... Oh, the wife. The think. wife that he had for 50 years or whatever. And he's apparently still in love with the ghost girl that was his destiny that he never got with. Well, who was Elise's real destiny? Or does he get both when uh, he moves on to become, to go be with Olympia, to be with Charlotte? Or is Elise screwed in the afterlife or what? I feel bad for her. I don't know. Do you feel bad at all for Elise? I guess I don't because, you know, she actually got to have him and the long lost girl didn't. True. Now, last week in the last episode, did we talk about Titanic? The fact that they don't end up together and that's the lost love? Or was that the first time we did Lost and that was Lost? It must There's have. There's got to be a better word. I don't remember talking about it. Well, let's talk about it now. And well, there was a lot of discussion when Titanic came out about every single detail of it because everybody had seen it. Twice and and three everybody times. either liked it or hated it or, more commonly, hated the people that loved it. <laughs> and one of the things that people we would talk about, myself included, was just, what about the yeah. husband that she later married and she had her whole life with? And this was her grandchild that she was telling the story to. And basically, it's like, you know what? If Jack hadn't died, you know, we would have lived our whole lives together. My assumption, I, I, I haven't seen Titanic in a long time. Uh-huh. But my assumption is she dies in her bed at the end of the movie. She wakes up and Jack is there waiting for her. Yeah. Uh, young. And, and she gets to be young again. And, they, and that's the representation of eternity. Now, that was my interpretation. I, and it's been a long time since I've seen it. Am I imagining? I no, do that... remember him at the top of the stairs and he holds out his hand. And yeah. She, does she take it as the old lady or is she, she young, Kate Winslet again? I think she's young again. But, but yeah, I remember thinking the same thing when that came out. There's another example of that. <sighs> How did the husband get so screwed? I mean, he was devoted to her for his whole life and had children and grandchildren with her. And, and she gets to go off and be with Jack when uh, she dies. And he's already dead. He's waiting for who now? You know, I think it's a universal thing that we always dwell on the one that got away. True. On what might have been, on, on the, the, the two ships that passed in the night and one of them hit an iceberg. No, and, and, and but they didn't get close <laughs> enough for us to touch. The the unknown is always more appealing than the known, than the familiar. Also, as soon as somebody dies, they're romanticized and they're there, there. People Who even knows? like Anna Nicole. I mean, geez. Well, I wouldn't go that far. Well, not the oh, geez part, but whatever you said before then. You know, Charlotte might not have been all that had they actually gotten together and found – I mean, OK, sure, she's got an astonishing knowledge of 80s pop culture. But you know what? He, he might have – tired of her he, her looks might have gone okay the story even reveals they go folks sophia loren at the golden globes last week notwithstanding <laughs> people <laughs> age and they lose their looks and because she's gone because she's dead because she's untouchable and unmarked by time she's perfect and she's wonderful and and my my uncle died recently and Everybody at the funeral was just talking about good times and good memories and nobody talked about what an ass that guy was because of his personality or the mistakes he had made in his life. And, and I don't know if I should cut this part out because it makes me sound like heel. The man is dead. But that's just how life works. Once somebody is gone, there's no point in still hating them. There's no point yeah. in dwelling on the wrong things. Why not dwell on the things that they did right? Because that's better to remember. Yeah. You know, interestingly, that's another thing that I wanted to mention in this story. 
not about how you romanticize people after they're dead and forget about their warts and only remember the beauty. And not just dead, but just gone. Yeah. But this astonishing knowledge of 80s films it was really an interesting thing as we were going through the story and we we're like wow you know look look at all these references and this girl who as is pointed out in the story he's like what you were like negative three when that movie came out how do you know it so well the other day i was in this group of people and they were talking about you know this and that and somebody mentioned the old trick of lighting a bag that's full of poop on fire when it's on somebody's front doorstep so they try and stomp out the fire and they get poop all over their shoe. The classics never go out of style, folks. And she said, yeah, like in that movie Can't Buy Me Love. And I went, oh, actually in Can't Buy Me Love they just had a bag full of poop that they threw at the door. And she's like, wow, you really know your 80s films. And then somebody else in this group starts going off. He's like, oh, I don't know anything about 80s. 80s was terrible. And he started mentioning things that were awful from the 80s. And like Monchi cheese? <laughs> he didn't mention was Monchi cheese, same? strangely enough. He probably wouldn't even have known what it was. I think he was younger than I am, this guy. But Sounds like a tool. I can't remember the things that he mentioned. There were two things, at least, that you could legitimately say were drawbacks to the 80s. And Max then, Headroom, Refrigerator Perry. I, I, you know, I liked both of those things. I liked things. both of those, too. No, yeah, he and then he mentions, oh, yeah, an MC Hammer and those big pants that he used to wear. And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's actually... Hold the phone, sir. That's, that's 90s. That's actually the 90s, sir. You've, you've gone too far. And I said that to him. To tell you the truth, I was flabbergasted. Oh, warning, the F word. When he said this, I think he may be the first guy I've ever met who despises 80s culture. And maybe it's just because I'm old... Because I have to equally, at least, if not more so than this guy, despise the 70s. I have a very hard time coming up with good things to say about the decade of the 70s. But I'm sure people who were older during the time that the 70s occurred have lots of good memories and lots of nice things to say about the decade. There's a, a fair number of movies that came out in the 70s that I like a lot. And we've talked about some of them ad nauseum on the show. But aside from that, there's very little. And I think it may just be how much I despise the whole disco culture and just how vile it is to see people dancing around in those one-piece bell-bottom suits and stuff like that. And, and there might have been a lot of good things about the 70s that I just sweep under the rug because the disco thing is such... It casts such a great shadow. Yeah, that might be it. I'm not sure what it is. It, it it's, casts a demon shadow. <laughs> it's interesting because I've never come across somebody that dislikes the 80s. And it seems like to me that that's just one of those very revered times or something. But maybe it's just me. You know, one time I was at a different complete gathering of people. They were talking about how... These are black masses you're talking about, aren't they? That's why it's so... It was a gathering so, of, so, of druids. <clears throat> I mean, not druids, the other thing, uh, people. This was at work. They were all talking at work. Most of the people that were speaking were older folks and older than me. Not old folks, as you might think when you say the word old folks, but people that are maybe 10 years older than me or so. And they were talking about how these days, maybe I've mentioned it. Have I mentioned this before on the show, how they were talking about how parents and children these days oh, are the, listening the to the same? the gap is much smaller. Yeah, did we've I, done this on the show. Did I say it on the show? It, you know what? Of all the episodes we've ever done, this is the one, to me, that feels almost like a radio show. We're just interrupting each other. It's <laughs> like, oh, shoot, we, we're out of time. We'll be right back, folks. Next up, another shitty song by Enya. But anyways, they were talking about how the generation gap these days is smaller than it ever was before and that children are listening to the same music that their parents listen to. They're little kids that are like, oh, yeah, my favorite band is Led Zeppelin and ACDC or something. And the older folks <laughs> in the crowd, they're like, was it just that music was just so great in the 60s and 70s and then by the 80s it fell apart and dropped away? And me and some of the other guys that were young were like, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. Hold off, sir. If it Emergency it, break. Yeah, we're like, if music hit its peak in any decade that has already gone past, it was definitely the 80s that it peaked. The day after Night Ranger's Sister Christian, <laughs> it was all downhill. 
you know, that's apparently that. You know, the people that are older than me, they think the 70s were great and the 80s were not so much, I guess. I don't know what the deal is, but it seems like the 80s have an awful lot of revered films and culture and so forth. I mean, in this story, there was what? There was Ghostbusters mentioned, E.T. mentioned, Back to the Future, Princess Bride... Ah, turn it up to 11 with Spinal Tap. So there was a lot of references to these uh, 80s films that are very beloved. It seems like that might be something that's kind of unique to our Pacific generation. Because at the time that we were growing up, VHS became a really big deal. Everybody had it. Before then, you saw movies on TV if you saw them at all. You know, you saw them in the theater or on TV and you didn't see them again and again and again and again. And so folks like me and you... We quote movies back and forth to each other all the time. Too but much? Probably. But older people don't. And I don't think younger people do it as much either because it seems like as the 90s began, video games are what took over for uh, movies. And so people played video games over and over and over again. So they can all whistle the theme to Mario Brothers or something like that. But Mario Brothers 18 by then. Well, yeah. But. You know, it also could be that the people who were growing up in the 80s, who were teenagers or, or, or children, are now the people creating all the entertainment, the movies and the television shows. Uh -huh. And that, and they get mentioned over and over again or get brought up again and again. And when you hear Seth MacFarlane <laughs> do these 80s references for Stewie, and you know, Stewie couldn't possibly know. Well, I mean, he couldn't possibly have the English okay. accent. And, and the... He couldn't talk, and he couldn't create a ray gun. And... Okay, so you've found a hole in that television <laughs> show. It's usually so logical. But, you know, it's just one of those things. Uh, also, South Park, you know, just filled with all these um, pop culture references that uh, real kids, real 10-year-olds, couldn't possibly know. It's just, I think it's just a reminder that, uh, you know what, I felt like the 80s were pretty dang good. Me too. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to bore you by saying that was the last time I was happy, but you know. <laughs> you just bored us by saying that was the last time you were happy. I, you know, I, I just, I really like the 80s. And for a long time, I wanted to do a TV show that was like The Wonder Years, only set in the 80s. Remember uh -huh. we used to talk about it yeah, all the time? Yeah, we did. The 80s, and I, I could be wrong, but to me as a kid, that was when technology went into overdrive. And suddenly, suddenly the world was changing way faster than it had been before. Yeah. And something new came out every single year that revolutionized the face of automaking or computers or television or whatever it might be. And now we get that, geez, every couple months at the most. It's daily almost these days. So it's hard, in my view, to hold something up like the iPod and say, this is the emblem of the 2000 O's. <laughs> the naughties. Because everything was so transient and everything is being topped next month. You know, it's like we always talk about the box office, that every month yep. there's a new record because just the world is moving faster and bigger and, and you can – or smaller in the case of, of my genitals or computer chips. <laughs> like you hold up the Rubik's Cube and people go, oh my gosh, and they know exactly what era that represents or a pet rock or a Studebaker. You know, one of these things right. that's just like, wow, that is mired – and mired in a good way in a certain era. But the odds, maybe we had... I think you may well be able to say iPod is the thing that's mired in this decade that just passed yes. away. I guess. Yeah, fair. There, there was a, a promo for some... I'm sure there's some, other things too. There was some NBC show that nobody's going to watch <laughs> where there was a guy and he'd gone into a coma for 10 years. I guess he'd gone into a coma in 2000 and he woke up and he's looking around. It's like... Boo! And some woman was saying, now, there's this thing called Facebook now, and it enables you to hook up with all the people that wouldn't have sex with you in high school. And, and you know, that just directly contradicts what I was saying about how fast technology moves. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm not I'm, – I'm saying it just well, – everything becomes arguments. easier and smaller and faster and cheaper, right? Because mm -hmm. the first MP3 player that I bought and the first MP3 player that you bought was so primitive. And yet it costs thrice what this awesome 8-gig MP3 player that does everything from take pictures to give you an x-ray. And, and, and it costs nothing. It's just one of those things that just in the last however many years since they introduced these things, 
they're everywhere. And you know, the Blu-ray player or whatever, you know, four hundred dollars two years ago, and it's now you know sixteen cents. Heck, we'll give you it for free. Just just take it and go. It's one of those things where I I'm, I need to stop talking because this is a long long episode. Uh, have I cursed enough? So just do it a little more, just in case. Dude, okay, that was not called for. I that that's not what I mean by a curse. I meant like the S word. Okay, so but th- this story was sent to us probably a long time ago, and you held it for Valentine's Day. I did. Uh, what was it about this one that grabbed you that made you say, you know what, this is a good holiday story? The dread holiday, <laughs> Valentine's Day. I I guess it was just that we mentioned it last year. We said, you know, well, gosh, this story would have been good for Valentine's Day. Too bad that was two weeks ago. That made me keep an eye out for stories that had some element of love in this. I don't know if this is really a good Valentine's Day story or not. Is the guy a creepy stalker or is he following his destiny? The woman is dead by the time he finds her and she's a ghost that's going to live in a hotel room watching 50th wedding anniversary sex for the rest of her existence until she's finally allowed to pass on. I don't know. And the stories last year, Mars and his hand and Clob both had happy. Yeah, they were very, very happy. And yet so far we had Lost, which was a story of love that couldn't happen. We have this story, which is again a story of love that should have but couldn't happen. Does that help people celebrate Valentine's Day or or am I just ruining the holiday for people, I wonder, by lining these stories up? I think the the nature of Valentine's Day ruins it for me. But (laughs) I like the fact that, you know, the love of these two characters is the main focus of the story. And I guess that's why I made them Valentine's Day stories. But uh, not so good, I guess, as far as the uh, happiness of the character. I guess at the end, he's like, I'm going to be there soon, Charlotte. So... Was that your impression of me doing an old man? Right? <laughs> I was supposed to be, That's yes. funny. You know, in the same way, uh, Titanic was seen as just unbelievably romantic. And it has a very similar ending. So there is true romance in this, then. Well, if you guys just can't take it anymore, you want me to stop serving up these sad tales to you for Valentine's Day, too bad. Because we got more. <laughs> Okay, well, next week, let's talk about that holiday, the dread holiday, Roberts, and we'll deal with it then, unless we forget, as we normally do. Okay. So, now we've come to the part of the show Rish really hates. Oh, no. Not the hate letter of the week. Uh, Look, I know we're long-winded and fond of poopy jokes. Do we have to acknowledge it on the air? Uh, Rish, we actually retired the whole uh, hate letter thing. Oh, yeah. In honor of the late B. Arthur. (laughs) You said it, 08 OT. No, uh, now we need to ask our gentle listeners if they would be so kind as to send us a donation. Yes, beg for donations. There's a PayPal link with a $5 a month, $5 a quarter, or a one-time donation option on it. Whatever you're able to give, it helps pay our authors, helps us cover our hosting fees. It also helps Rish feel less alone in the world. No, it doesn't. Not really. I know there's not a ton of money floating around out there, but if you're able, any size donation, great or small, is appreciated. Yeah, size doesn't matter. You just keep telling yourself that, friend. Zing! (laughs) All right. Thank you for listening all the way through the show. That's right. Thanks to the people who did voices. Thanks for being you. We couldn't do it without you. Well, I'd do it without anyone, but... Come on, man. Just because they talk about porn in this show doesn't mean you got to go there. Okay. Would it be too much to ask the robot to kindly excise that last? Oh, it OT. He says no. Sorry. Okay, thank you, man. It's good to know some things never change. I have been Rish Outfield. And I remain Big Anklevich. He tells me a story about a girl he knows in Kentucky. He just made that story up. There ain't no girl like that. See you later. Good night. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell 
or change the files. Thank you for listening. So, so a second ago, we were talking about songs that uh, get played into the ground and they, uh-huh. and, and they're just ruins. They ruin your love for that song. And, and, and I think we both agreed that that John Mellencamp song was not played. Yeah, I mean, it might have a- been played in to the ground but just to the very surface of the ground and it sprouted right up as yeah, soon as you made it made a nice little tree in the end that's the good thing we were mentioning that as we were checking out the quote yeah you're just like gosh that's a great song and i was saying it's not one of those songs that was played into the ground but it is one of those songs like unchained melody or any song by new order where you just can't remember the title to save your life and I bet you a dollar you couldn't remember the song. <laughs> of course I remembered it. And, but uh, it reminds me, was it this story that had a Jack and Diane in it? There, there was a it couple. It was. That's right. That was uh, Charlotte's mother and father were Jack and Diane. Now, don't you think that that's an odd coincidence that here we got a Mellencamp quote. <laughs> it was totally <laughs> unconnected that. to the story. And then, yeah. We should have done a Jack and Diane quote instead. Maybe we should have. Dribble off them Bobby Brooks slacks and do what I please. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Warning. Hey, it's you're way too late for that announcer, man. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you know, that kind of makes me wonder uh, how many times there are like little in jokes for characters names and stuff like that. Yeah, like if somebody names all the characters after like Twin Peaks, something like that. Well, yeah, if that kind of crap went on, I think that would be pretty glaring and we wouldn't. Yeah, or if somebody go. named like all their characters after like the actors that played Star Trek. Exactly. These are these are the things where I wonder, you know, if it's yeah. all the Back to the Future cast or it's it's the characters from Dune or uh, what other stories have I done on the air? Don't you have anything worthwhile to say? Take two. He was smitten by her fiery personality and penchant for discussing the works of Edward Abbey. She did have a penchant for buggery. My father was an unemployed lingerie owner with a penchant for buggery. He once was fisted by Sebastian Cabot. On the really bad days, he contemplated escaping to the only place where he would never be reminded of her again. The gay bathhouse. Instead of reaching for a solid meat and potato meal. Yeah, where are you from? <laughs> it's <his> potato. <laughs> Maybe Colonel Uh, Sanders says potato. Probably. A few of the freckles that had been sprinkled on her nose had fallen off and landed on the top of her bare chest. Her raven-colored hair framed her heart-shaped face and tickled the top of her nubile body. (laughs) (laughs) This is my kind story. I like it already. Will's outlook improved. He was convinced that he wasn't ready to leave the world anymore. Not while she was still in it. But she was already dead, and he didn't know that. He was going to be so depressed when he found out. This time, she had a co-star. A fat, balding man with patches of brown hair on his pasty white back. Just like Rish. I appreciate that, sir. But it's our policy to poop all over your face. Yeah, you like it. I think you have something there. Mm. Let me know if you need anything else. Peace out. Or, just kidding. Peace out. He found Charlotte, not Olympia, on a social networking site where she worked on necks. Ew. And told him a tale about a fair maiden. Charlotte was born and raised in Winnesset, Iowa. I'd say I liked Charlotte from the start. She had a quiet way about her. A way of walking and talking. A way of being naked on the internet. To two loving parents, Jack and... This is a little ditty about Jack and Diane, isn't it? (laughs) To two loving parents, Jack and Diane... Two American kids doing the best that they can. Jackie said he's going to be a football star. Oh yeah, life goes on. (laughs) Long after the thrill of living Living is gone. gone. She was encouraged by the progress, but the progress stopped there. Long after her parents had quit sending her money. This sounds like the song to me. 
Long after her parents had quit sending her money. <laughs> Stack of rejections. Dwindle her savings away. Long after her parents. <laughs> By the progress. The progress stopped there. Oh, yeah. Progress stopped there. Long, Long after, after her parents, parents quit, quit sending, sending her money. The stack of rejections dwindled her savings away. <laughs> The other, although much more rugged, led to her lifelong dream. Charlotte was blessed with many assets, if you know what I mean. Will was disappointed, but was content with the kisses. Actually, he was content just by being next to her. And besides, he'd probably freeze his schlong off if he tried to do it with a ghost. It's worth a try. <laughs> It's worth sacrificing your dong. <laughs> say dong very often. <laughs> dong. Is that for my benefit? Dong. Yeah, that was for your benefit. <laughs> dong is one of those words that just went away <laughs> once you got old enough to realize how awful it was. As a gift, Charlotte granted him one last boner, something he hadn't had in 27 years. The end.